Hi, welcome to Exploring the Illusion of Free Will. My name is George Ortega, and this is episode number 143, Free Will, Refuting Roy Baumeister's Slate.com Defense, Part 4. Okay, this is Part 4. Basically, this is like, this is a critique of an article that psychologist Roy Baumeister published in Slate Magazine, Slate.com, on September 25th. And it's called, um, Do You Really Have a Free Will? Okay, and basically like, yeah, this is a series on refuting. And I'm, I'm basically paraphrasing what he said. Sometimes I'll quote it. And, <laughs> and we're on page one. I've got seven pages of this. Like, well, you know, you know, I'm going to refute all the statements. And I, I thought this might be done in three or four episodes. It might take five or six or seven or eight. I have no idea. Because like, I want to like, with each point he makes, I want to really refute it completely. Okay, and like again, like sometimes you may be watching this episode, but you didn't watch the episode before, the episode before that, you know? So, like, so, you know, I just want to keep refuting his points as he makes them so you understand why we don't have a free will. Okay, last episode, part three, Baumeister had claimed that scientists were refuting unscientific versions of free will. And I had to correct them. And I, you know, I basically said, no, the scientists who are refuting free will are refuting both scientific and unscientific versions. And these scientific and unscientific versions of free will are coming from philosophers and scientists, you know, psychologists that are trying to defend free will. And so anyway, he, in, 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 um, he goes on to say, like, there's this guy, John Barge, that apparently he's friends with um, Baumeister. And they had a debate, and you can see it online. I've seen it. Um, and in it, Bar Barge, incidentally, he's a psychologist who's pretty well known for his priming experiments. Basically, he would um, prime subjects. Like, for example, he would, or here's an example of priming. This is like to demonstrate that what, what we ordinarily attribute to our conscious mind, to our freely willed mind, whatever, is actually taking place at the level of the unconscious. So Barge, he's a Yale psychologist. He would, let's say, separate his subjects into two groups, and they would like some have. Um, they would both have like a word task. Um, they would have these words, and they were, let's say, um, they were instructed to make sentences from them. Right? All right. So like, with one group, the sentences that they were instructed to make had words like rude, um, disrespectful, you know, abrupt, stuff like that, you know, words that, that connote rudeness. Um, the other group, their words that they had to construct sentences from, whatever, had words like polite, considerate, you know, patient, and stuff like that, right? So here's the thing. So like, the subjects in these experiments, they, um, <coughs> they conducted this test, you know, with the words. They thought the experiment was over, you know, at that, at that point. And then they were instructed to, like, hand over their results to a colleague of John Barge's, right? Now, the colleague was in on the experiment because the experiment wasn't over. Because, like, basically the colleague of Barge was instructed to be in conversation with someone for 10 minutes, so, so the person, you know, who wanted to hand in their, their experimental results would either have to wait 10 minutes or interrupt the conversation, okay? So, what they found out, and this is just one of dozens, perhaps hundreds of different priming experiments that show this kind of result. The, the subjects that were primed with words like rude and abrupt interrupted John Barge's colleagues' conversation much more quickly, you know, than, you know, than did the ones who, who were primed with, with words like polite and, and, you know, respectful and stuff. All right? And the other part of this was, like, they were asked afterwards, well, you know, why did you, why did you interrupt when you did? Or why did you wait as long as you did? And the subjects confabulated. They, they, ba they basically made up reasons that didn't have any, didn't, you know, 
present any kind of a clue that they were aware of the priming that had been done. In other words, they didn't, none of them said, well, I, I actually, I waited, you know, as long as I did because, you know, <laughs> in this experiment before, you know, I was perceiving these words polite and, you know, whatever. They didn't have an awareness of this. So this is, again, so that's, that's Barge's, um, he's done a lot of experiments like this that, that actually demonstrate, you know, empirically that we don't have a free will, that, that you know, actions that we're attributing to our conscious mind are actually taking place at the level of the unconscious. All right, so anyway, so Barge is saying that, Bar, um, I mean, Baumeister is saying that Barge once said in a debate that, quote unquote, free will means free from freedom from causation. Okay, now, correction. Barge said that, but he's referring to libertarian definitions or defenses of free will. In other words, like Barge is refuting all versions of free will, whether they claim that causality exists or not. So like, for example, some philosophers will say, well, not everything is caused, or, or some things are first cause. And the libertarian philosophers, completely insane kind of view, they don't believe that everything is caused. You know, they believe some things happen that are uncaused. But, um, but if something is uncaused, how can you attribute it to a human being? You know, and they'll say, well, like, well, actually, you know, what will happen in the decision is like that the person will make the decision, but then there's nothing that's causing the person to make the decision, okay? Now, first, you know, again, that's not the way it works, because if you're accepting causality, then you have to accept that the decision has a cause, the person, and then there has, has to be a, a reason why that person made a decision, or at least a cause. There doesn't have to be a quote-unquote reason. Um, all right, but the other thing is that, um, okay, with the libertarian thing also is like, so they're, they're claiming that, that the person makes a decision and there's, there's no cause for it. But another reason this libertarian version, defense of free will, fails is because one of the, one of the um, ways to define free will is that, like, if we have a free will, if what we do is up to us and not up to things that aren't in our control, then that means that we're fundamentally morally responsible for what we do. In other words, we can take credit for the good we do and we're to blame fundamentally, not pragmatically, because that's a different point, for the wrong we do. So according to this libertarian version of free will that claims that, well, you know, like, we cause our decisions, our moral decisions in this case, but nothing is causing us to cause them, then they're basically saying that we're, we're making these moral decisions without any moral precepts, you know, without any moral reasoning, without any moral principles upon which to base our decision, in which case, you know, we wouldn't be morally responsible for them because they're, they're again, they're amoral, not immoral in the sense they're like without morality. So anyway, that, the, that libertarian version of free will fails on both counts. One is because things have causes, and two, because like, if you're claiming that a free will decision is caused by a person or a person's will, but then there's no cause to that, then you're basically saying that that person wasn't morally responsible, you know, for, for the decision. Anyway, so um, so anyway, Baumeister is kind of like claiming that um, that people who are refuting free will are refuting a version of free will that is free of causation, you know, like this libertarian. But no, the, the Barge and, and many other scientists, philosophers, are refuting all versions of free will. Um, another thing about the term free will, um, it, it's incoherent, it's internally inconsistent, and here's what I mean. Okay, incidentally, like, Baumeister believes in a version of free will. He's what, what's known in philosophy as compatibilists. He, he believes that we have free will, but he also believes in causality, you know, or he, st he says he believes in causality, but if he actually did understand causality sufficiently, because he can't understand 
causality sufficiently and still believe you have a free will. But anyway, he, um, Baumeister believes that, you know, that we have a free will and uh, things are caused. Um, all right, the reason the, the term free will is internally inconsistent, and this, this relates to the causality thing. Okay, um, some people, not Baumeister, but others, say that um, they're not, not, they refute or they deny causality. They say some things are not caused, okay? But in order to, for you to have a free will, conceptually, linguistically, rationally, logically, you know, your decisions would have to be caused by you. You know, your will, you know, would have to be your will. You're causing your will. You're, you're making your quote-unquote choice and all. So basically, this version of free will that denies or attempts to refute causality can't work because free will requires causality. In other words, to, to be able to have a free will to attribute your thoughts to yourself and they're not compelled by anything else, you have to establish a cause. You have to be causing them. So obviously, once you've established a cause, you've introduced causality and, you know, this chain of cause and effect that goes back before your decisions <coughs> makes it impossible. I'm tired. I, um... All right, this is part four. I didn't get much sleep last night, um, and this is like the third show that I'm taping because I tape three at a time. But all right, let's 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 continue with this. Okay. Now, by Baumeister is claiming that, you know, that these some scientists are arguing against the version of free will that claims that our decisions are caused by like a soul or some supernatural being, you know entity, you know, is causing our... Yeah, I mean, people who refute free will are refuting all versions, but they don't believe that. They don't believe that, you know, that our decisions are caused by a soul. But Baumeister doesn't believe that, but, you know, you know, again, Baumeister is, is kind of like making the, 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 the point, trying to make the claim that scientists who refute free will are refuting these versions of free will but again, my point is that's not the only version of free will or the only explanation of free will that they're exploring. And incidentally, we might as well refute that, that version of free will now. Um, some people, for example, will claim that, um, and again, Baumeister doesn't do this, but like, you know, he's referring to it some. Some people will claim that our decisions are not subject to causality because they're not physical, they're immaterial, non-material, okay? Um, here's why that claim is wrong. Um, whenever you make a decision, that decision has to take place within a moment in time, okay? Um, you know, you make a decision, it happens, let's say, at, at 2.58, whatever, you know, you make a decision. All right, once that decision occupies a specific precise place and time, it's part of the universe. I mean, like, the way Einstein explained it is that, like, time cannot exist outside of space, okay? You can't have time without having space, and space can't exist outside of time. He described time and space as kind of like space-time. And so, like, the idea is, like, if, you're, if, if any one of your decisions occupies a specific place in time, it's part of the universe. It can't exist outside of the universe, okay? Because time, again, the universe is like mass energy moving through space-time. That's most precisely what it is. You know, I think there, there are fields, whatever, that, you know, I think everything is mass energy. So, yeah, it's like mass energy moving through space-time, moving through space in time. So again, if you have, if you, um, if you want to try to defend free will by claiming that your decision is spiritual or non-material, but you're acknowledging that it takes place in time, that decision is subject to the laws of nature, so the physical laws of nature that govern the entire universe, and so it's therefore subject to the law of causality. 
Okay, so again, if you're making a spiritual decision, you're, you're claiming it's spiritual, it's going to have a cause, a physical cause. And that, you know, I've explained, I've explained this before. The, um, the best way to describe causality is in terms of the state of the universe. In other words, like, the state of the universe at the Big Bang was the only thing that could have caused the state of the universe at the next moment of the universe, you know, the second state of the universe. And the only thing that can explain the third moment of the universe, the state of the universe of the third moment, is that second state of the universe, the, the state of the universe of the second moment. So anyway, so like, you can describe causality as this state-by-state -state evolution of the universe. And see, the reason this is the most precise, comprehensive, and um, best way to describe causality is because it describes everything. Um, in other words, like, some people will claim, well, you know, we don't know the causes of, of our decisions, so we can't say they're caused. But we do know them, okay? Basically, the idea is like, because we know this, the universe evolves in a state-by-state -state manner, and also because we know that individual events within the universe cannot reside outside of the universe, they have to be part of this state-by-state -state evolution of the entire universe, then we know that, for example, any decision we make is really caused by the state of the universe at the moment prior to the decision. And that state of the universe is caused by the state of the universe prior to that moment. And that state is caused, you know, so basically you have this regression of causes, you know, that are the state of the universe at that moment, regressing back from each decision and regressing back to before the person was born and ultimately back to the Big Bang. So anyway, that's, that's why, um, that's why, that's how the spiritual, you know, contentions that, that we have a free will are refuted, just by, by, by understanding that the states of the universe regress back from any decision we make to the Big Bang. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, page two. <laughs> All right. Here we go. So, and this is, I can't believe there were seven pages. It's part four. I don't know how many parts it's going to make. We've got about ten minutes left. Okay. Now, he's claiming that these arguments, like about the um, supernatural and whatever that I just refuted, you know, are, that, that's not what people really mean when they say free will. Basically, what people mean when they say free will is that they are consciously making choices and they're making choices absent of, quote unquote, in the absence of external coercion. And also, quote unquote, accepting responsibility for one's actions. Oh, this is going to take a show. This is going to take a, you know, I, I'm going to have to probably get into this more in the, the next episode. But let's, let's, let's address this, this um, statement um, point by point. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, he's right. Most people do understand free will to mean that we're consciously making choices and that we're morally responsible for those choices. He's right, but like these sciences that are refuting free will are also refuting that contention. Okay? Now we're gonna we're gonna explain why um why we don't make conscious choices. We explained it in the last last episode and the episode before that, but we have to keep doing it because like this is a show. <laughs> All right. Um Basically, we don't make conscious decisions. First, we don't make causal cause. Um, we um, we don't make choices. All right, we don't technically make choices. We kind of like figuratively or colloquially make choices, but we real, we really don't make choices. Because, like as I explained before, if if all of our choices are the result of the state by state evolution of the universe that's regressing back to before we were born. Most precisely, most technically, it's the Big Bang or whatever came before that that's actually making the choices that we manifest. Okay, so like, so that's one. You know, we're refuting the, the choice component of like this popular conception of free will 
the Baumeisters, I think, you know, claiming the scientists aren't refuting. They are refuting that also. <clears throat> okay. The second thing he's saying, Baumeister's saying that, like, you know, the popular conception of free will is that we're consciously making choices. Okay, so let's refute that. And, like, I think, yeah, next episode we'll probably get into the responsibility part of it. We might be able to get into it a bit in this one, but basically here's why we don't make conscious decisions. Anytime we make a decision, we've got to base it on information, on data, okay? And this data has to be stored someplace. But the problem is that our conscious mind is not a data storage mechanism. It's a, it's a mechanism of awareness. Consciousness is awareness. To be conscious is to be aware. And this consciousness is fleeting. It's momentary. Right now, you're aware of your thoughts at the present moment. You're aware of what I'm saying. You might be aware of a few other things. But it's, you know, consciousness is awareness. You're not storing data in your consciousness because your consciousness is, is changing moment by moment. Okay? So what does that mean? That means that all of the information that you're going to base your decision on, all of the data, the memories, the cognitions, the perceptions, the sensations, the principles, you know, all your learning, it's got to be stored in your unconscious. Now, now if you're making decisions, incidentally, in your unconscious, they can't be freely willed because you can't control your unconscious. You're not even aware of it. That's the thing. So, let's, so you've got the unconscious mind that is where the data for your decisions are stored, okay? And it's not just the data. It's also the principles upon which you decide. When you decide whether to eat, let's say, an apple or an orange or whatever, you don't really go through your conscious mind, well, you know, this sort of, I mean, sometimes you do, but essentially the stronger point is that, like, since your conscious mind isn't a data storage mechanism, all this stuff has to be stored at the level of the unconscious. Now, again, by definition, your conscious mind isn't aware of your unconscious, at least in real time. That's why they call it the unconscious. So the on only part of your mind that has access to the data upon which you're going to decide is your unconscious. Okay? So what happens in the decision is that, like, your conscious mind sifts through all its information, its principles, you know, its moral dictates, whatever, and then it decides, okay? It decides whatever, you know, because again, your, un your conscious mind doesn't have, have access to that information. Again, it doesn't even know that the unconscious exists. That's why they call it the unconscious. So you've got the unconscious mind sifting through the information, deciding, and then making us aware of our decisions, okay? We're, we're aware, and that's, that's at the unconscious's discretion. In other words, we can't tell the unconscious what to make us aware of, because if we could, you know, we could, for example, um, be taking a test, and we could just, like, instruct our unconscious, all right, I want the answer to this, you know, I want the answer to this, and we could, in real time, access all our memories. We can't do that. That's why, you know, that's why we have to study hard to kind of like make those connections stronger and hope that our, the unconscious will remember. So anyway, that's, that's essentially why um, <clears throat> all our choices are made at the level of the unconscious. And again, if, if our choices are made at the level of the unconscious, they can't be freely willed. Now, that, that's a kind of like a um, logical, rational, scientific explanation of why we don't have a free will because our decisions are made at the level of the unconscious. If you want empirical evidence of this, if you want to understand this through countless experiments um, that have been conducted, um, there's a guy, a psychologist, a Harvard psychologist, Daniel Wegner. Excuse me, in 2002, he published a book called The Illusion of Conscious Will. Now, again, I've just gone through kind of like the logical reasons why we don't have a conscious will. Our will is unconscious. But in this book, it's pretty dense. It you know, goes into a lot of material. He really exhaustively presents a lot of experiments that demonstrate that a lot of, a lot of material, 
a lot of decisions we're actually we think we're making consciously are actually being made at the level of the unconscious again it's called the explore um the illusion of conscious will by daniel wegner all right well all right in the last part you know baumeister is saying that most people's understanding of free will is that we're morally responsible for our actions okay and he's right and the scientists who refute free will are refuting this version also not just scientists philosophers um why are we not morally now we're talking about fundamental and actually no no i'm i'm reading this like the, the exact quote is like accepting responsibilities for for our actions here's the thing no the the con- conventional understanding of free will is that we're fundamentally responsible for our our actions not that we're quote unquote accepting responsibility so baumeister gets this wrong you know why do i say this because like for example einstein albert einstein understood that free will is an illusion but he quote unquote accepted responsibility because that's what we do we assume quote unquote responsibility we quote unquote hold others responsible pragmatically for what they do because we have to do that in order to maintain our society to maintain our rules our order and all that stuff but that understanding and that pragmatic responsibility doesn't rely on this belief in free will all right and we've got less than a minute and because this is a very important point I'm going to start off next episode um part 5 of this series with you know this 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 um mistaken attribution between accepting responsibility and having free responsibility and why we actually don't have fundamental responsibility because basically the causes to all our decisions span back to before we were born and because if our decisions are made at the level of our unconscious and we're not in control of our unconscious we can't be responsible fundamentally for what our unconscious does. All right, thanks for watching. This is George Ortega. I will be back next time with part 5 of this series on Baumeister's article and um have a great day. Thanks.